This is Support is Sexy, episode 388, with visibility strategist, Jen Scalia. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I bring you inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and lessons to help you take your business to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. It just would not be the same without you. And I am super excited today to share with you, you know, if you've been listening for a little while, you know, this year I've been talking about girlonpodcast.com. It's a booking company that focuses on women who podcast and women who guest, supporting women on both sides of the mic. But I'm excited to share with you today a free guide that I just developed I think it's really good. I hope you think it's really good on how to be an unforgettable podcast guest. So this is for you. If you've already been guesting for a while, that's great. We could all use some refreshers and maybe a few tips. Or if you're just starting out, maybe you're just thinking about it or you've done one or two shows here and there and you want to get better. I'm giving this to you from the perspective of being a guest, also someone who's worked in media for 20 plus years. Also, being a podcast host who has interviewed more than 200 women. So to get this guide, I want you to go to girlonpodcastgift.com. So that's G-I-F-T, because it's a free gift. It's a free guide. Girlonpodcastgift.com. Download the guide. I'll send it to you in your email, and you let me know what you think. 10 great tips on how to be a great, unforgettable podcast guest, but also things that you need to know about why podcast guesting is becoming more popular. Included some of that in there as well. So again, girlonpodcastgift.com. Now, I don't know about you, but if you have been listening to the shows this year, first of all, I always say, All of my guests are fantastic. All of my guests, I love them all and appreciate them for saying yes, for showing up for us on Support is Sexy, sharing their stories and their expertise. This year, my mind, maybe because I'm in an open space, it's early in the year if you're listening to this in real time. It's January, so we're in that space of building, being open, thinking about possibility is the word for the year for me, possibility. So my mind has been being blown in a good way by all of the women who have come on the show this year or the episodes that I've aired this year, in all honesty. Some of them were taped last year, but I listen to them when you listen to them. And when I go over them again and hear the expertise that's shared, the stories that are shared, and just the insight that's shared, it really has been blowing my mind. I've been really open to it. And Jen Scalia is no exception. I know you're going to love the story that she shares today and her advice. Jen is a visibility strategist. She focuses on marketing and helping women understand the need to be more visible, having the courage to be more visible and learning the skills to be more visible. It's a combination of both, right? And Jen talks about how much mindset plays into us being successful or not in our businesses. In fact, she uses a term that I love that she calls mindset infused marketing. And Jen says your success, she believes, isn't just about marketing. In fact, she says it's 10% marketing and 90% mindset. So mindset is a strong thread throughout this episode. Be sure to listen out to that. And in fact, Jen tells her story of how she went from zero, making zero dollars in her business. You know, that first year is tough for a lot of us. Zero dollars to $500,000 in revenue in two years, which is no time. Zero to 500000 And she did that in large part by shifting her mindset. Of course, doing the work, but all of us, most of us, right, are doing the work. But how much is your mindset holding you back? Maybe that's why I was really into this too. Possibility mindset, got to believe in the possibility. And Jen also says, you got to check your story. Make sure you're not telling yourself the same old story that's keeping you stuck. And last thing I'll say before I let you hear from Jen herself, she also says, be careful what you're committed to. Don't be committed to the BS. We actually say the word in here. So if the kids are around, go ahead and put your headset on. All right. So again, I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Great expertise from Jen. So without further ado, Jen Scalia. 
So, Jen, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to chat with you. I'm excited to share with your audience as well today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Excellent. So our first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? So this is actually an interesting question because um, usually when I talk about my entrepreneurship journey, I start with my current business that I started about four years ago. But I actually have been doing a lot of like little entrepreneurship uh, things on the side since I was really young. Um, But one of the first things um, that comes to mind is I actually had a clothing company with my ex-husband and um, we made and sold clothes all over boutiques in the United States. We had our clothing on celebrities and that was really like our, our main thing. We used to have fashion shows. We did all kinds of amazing things and it was just really awesome to like build something and build it from scratch and see it flourish and get into the hands of celebrities and all over the world. So it was pretty awesome. Wow. Was it a clothing line or was it a special uh, custom line that you guys did for celebrities or? Yeah, no, it was just a a regular clothing line. It was custom clothing. So we customized each piece. Um, You know, there was only like maybe a handful of each piece available in each size. And so we were very unique and, you know, just really exclusive boutiques around the country. Mm, isn't it interesting though to look back as you said and think about once I think once you become an entrepreneur maybe this becomes more apparent but all the things you did even before then maybe (laughs) when you were younger that's like oh I actually was always looking at a way to start a business or something absolutely yeah I do that too it's like oh yeah I did always want to see how I could I didn't know what it was called at the time but now I understand it it was baby entrepreneurship (laughs) (laughs) so tell us about your background and where you grew up Awesome. So I am a, a Jersey girl. I ah, grew up Jersey. In, in, yeah, in New Jersey, in South Jersey. I call it the other Jersey. Um, right. because most people think of New Jersey, they think of New York City and, you know, um, industry and lots of movement. But I grew up in the country. I grew up in a very quiet town, a very small town. There's actually only 2000 people in the town that um, I, yeah. I lived in and my parents still live in. So very, very small, um, humble beginnings. Um, um, and, you know, I, I was born and raised in that area. And um, my dad was an, actually an entrepreneur, which is really funny also because he never encouraged entrepreneurship. So just like you said, I didn't really know what it was called. Um, I knew he had a business. I knew he had been running a business since he was 14 years old. I knew mm. he made his own money. I knew he was o- his own boss. But I didn't really understand that it was never really encouraged for us to, like, go out and be entrepreneurs. So, And I had a pretty traditional home. I have a sister, um, a parents, my dog. um, And, you know, I was just always, I was always an overachiever. Um, Definitely (laughs) always an overachiever, straight A student, had to be, you know, straight attendance in class and everything like that. And, you know, I went off to college and um, I thought I was going to be a doctor, actually. That's actually what I went to college for, for pre-med. And I quickly, very quickly actually realized that this is not the path that I meant to be on. And it was just way too many rules and way too straight laced and way too traditional for me. And, you know, once I was able to come out of my shell more in college is when I really started to explore different ways of like, you know, what do I really like? What are my passions? How do I like to connect with people and communicate with people? And I that's where I really found social media. Mm. And that that was kind of like the start of like everything that I'm doing right now. (laughs) Now, where did you go to school? Uh, I went to Temple University. In- oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, not too far from Jersey. Excellent. Yeah. I have a friend who she's from Willingboro, so I know about South Jersey, oh. right? <laughs> and she lives in, I think it's, it's her street is either Mickle either Mickleton or she lives in Mickleton or she lives in Sewell somewhere down it's like exit two or something (laughs) totally (laughs) familiar yeah (laughs) excellent so I get it South Jersey girls I love them now one quick thing about your dad you mentioned him having his own business which you didn't really know sort of I guess for you that was what his work was Mm -hmm. Um, did he encourage you at all to become an entrepreneur either before you started talking about doing it on your own or once you started doing it or do you feel like he um he created his business out of necessity because you said he started when he was about 14. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was never encouraged. It was never talked about, which Mm -hmm. I find that's really interesting. Like I know for me, like, you know, it's definitely a conversation that I'm going to be having with my son and, you know, a path that I would love for him to take. Uh, So it's just really interesting that, you know, it was never brought up um, in our family. I mean, from his perspective, it was more, it it was really hard and, you know, Mm -hmm. he had to work really hard for his money. And so there's a lot of like money stuff and mindset stuff 
and money stories that came along with that. So all I ever knew was that my dad worked really hard and he was always stressed out, but that he was his own boss and he had his own business. So even as I started to like branch out on my own, it still was never really talked about as like something that was, you know, um, you know, something that people actually wanted to do. Um, so really interesting. But again, you know, I have an old school father as well. So Me too. that could just be, you know, the times, you know, times now, where, you know, the time that we live in now, it's, it's, you know, it's what people do, you know, and, and people are proud of. And yeah, I, I don't know what the thought process was back then, but definitely wasn't something that was encouraged. Mm-hmm. So after college, you mentioned that you discovered social media. What was it about social media that other than it being built to be addictive, but yeah. what, what drew you to it? Well, I was actually in college. And so I'm an introvert, um, very much an introvert. And, you know, I really just uh, find it hard to like connect with people or go out into, you know, regular atmospheres and networking events and kind of just connect with people. And I had found that probably, really, it was probably like my freshman year where I found social media and it was like MySpace and um, AIM. We had our like AIM chats and stuff like that. And I just got really good at like doing little things to go on there and creating my profile and, and being creative with things. And so that's kind of like where my passion and desire grew from there. Um, And I really just started to to see it as a way to like, you know, help companies that I started working for. So I would work for a traditional company, like get hired in a traditional role, like an admin or something like that. And I always encouraged my um, employers to seek more of this like social media role and a marketing role um, within that company. And were they resistant at first? Because I know in the early days of social media, a lot of companies didn't think that they needed it. Even companies in media, I come from media and even magazines and those kinds of things thought social media was a passing (laughs) trend. Yeah, I mean, you know, they didn't really resist it that much. I mean, they thought it was pretty interesting. They knew I was, you know, younger. And so they I feel like they kind of heard it, you know, they kind of heard me. And, um, you know, so it it was more of like I said, traditional jobs. So I was working for um, I was working for a physical therapist. um, And I started doing all of their social media and all of their marketing. Uh, Then I was working for a um, shopping mall entertainment uh, place and started doing their social media and started like running giveaways and contests and all kinds of fun stuff for their um, their shoppers. Um, so that was interesting. And then really the thing that I feel like changed the game for me was when I got hired um, at a casino in Atlantic City. So if you're local, I'm sure you, you know what Atlantic City is. Mm-hmm. And I ended up working for one of the largest casinos in Atlantic City. And um, I was doing all of their social media and marketing. And it was just such an amazing and great experience. And I loved it. And, you know, I ended up getting uh, laid off from that job because um, casinos do massive layoffs when their revenues go down. Right. And yeah, just like you said, you know, the the higher ups were like, we don't need social media, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need somebody to do social media. So I was one of the people that got cut. Um, And it was really at that point that I decided to start my own business. So I guess it all happened for a reason. It definitely did. (laughs) Now, what at what point did the fashion line come into play here between when you were doing the social media work and then starting your own independent business? Was that in between? That was it, kind of in between. So, um, yeah, it was, you know, after high school or after college, rather, and before I got the job at the casino. But, you know, while I was working some of the other jobs, I was doing the clothing line on the side with my husband. OK, so you still had the clothing line. OK, yep. so at what point then did you evolve into an expert as you are today in helping women create wealth and live empowered lives? How did that become your why? Yeah. So, I I mean, essentially what happened was, you know, if I'll start at the layoff um, of the job at the casino, um, I pretty much just got pissed off. I Mm -hmm. got mad. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the heck? You know, I had I was on maternity leave with my son for two years. I just gotten back to work. Um, I was actually loving my job. So unlike most people who are like, I want to get out of my job. I hate corporate. I want to leave. You know, Um, I liked my job. So when I got laid off, I wasn't happy at all. I was really like I was really upset. And, you know, I kind of felt like, man, I have to start all over again. And, And, you know, at that time, I was also going through a lot of personal stuff and you know, me and my husband started having troubles and we ended up getting divorced in that time period. And it was just a lot of stuff that was going on for me in that time. And, you know, the first thing was that I knew I had a skill. I knew that I was really great at marketing. I knew that I was really great at social media. I knew that I had had all of these like 
endeavors in the past where I wanted to have my own thing and I wanted to start my own thing. So that's kind of where the seed was planted. And I was like, if I could do this for, you know, a multi-billion dollar large casino, like I can certainly do this for myself, number one. And I can certainly do this for other smaller companies. Um, so that's kind of where that that started. So the evolution of my business, um, really, it started as more social media and marketing for small businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, then it transitioned into more around confidence and getting yourself out there. Because um, once I transitioned from offline marketing to online marketing, I had to also deal with a lot of stuff, completely different ball games, <laughs> you know, offline marketing and off- online marketing. So, um, you know, I had my own little evolution. And I really started helping people become more visible and be confident in what they were doing and again a more a new evolution in my business which I feel like my business is constantly evolving is like that's the passion the real underlying reason that I'm helping people be visible the real underlying reason that I'm helping people make money in their business the reason why I'm helping people with their social media is so that they can create just massive massive wealth and freedom in their lives that's really the underlying reason and it's because that's what I need to do for my son and I. Mm-hmm. Now, during that time when you were going through um, your things in your personal life, was it difficult um, to pick yourself up and start with a new business or a new venture after you're being laid off, you're going through things in your personal life? And the reason I ask that is because, you know, I talk about, at least for me, entrepreneurship has taught me I don't know if it's either how to or the need to kind of compartmentalize things, if possible. But sometimes things just kind of flow into each other and one affects (laughs) the other. You know what I mean? One affects the other. Yes, especially (laughs) if it's a very low, you know, something that's a really tough thing to go through because you're human. So I'm just curious um, to hear from you. And then for anyone who's going through maybe a tough time, but they either need to get started on a business or an idea they want to, but they might just be feeling stuck. Yeah, I mean, I always say that, like, when I started my business, I feel like I had literally everything that could be working against me was working against me. Mm-hmm. You know, I just gotten laid off, I was going through a divorce, and, you know, became a single mom, like, basically overnight, I had to move back in with my parents after the divorce, I had, you know, a little bit of depression going on, I was $60,000 in debt, like, literally everything that could be working against me was. Mm-hmm. And instead of, you know, kind of wallowing in, in the self pity and saying like, oh, you know, this life sucks. And you know, I'm just going to keep doing this. And um, I, I feel like it, it helped me evolve. I feel like it was my time to like, do something different with my life and change um, the circumstances. And, you know, really, I just did it for my son. He was really my inspiration to change it because I didn't want to him to see me struggle. I didn't want him to see me with money issues. I didn't want him to see me unhappy. I didn't want him to see me um, doing something that I didn't really want to do. So he was definitely my motivation and just all of the stuff that was happening, instead of using it to feel sorry for myself, I used it as fuel to to go for it, to really, really go for it. How old was your son at that time? Uh, My son was two and a half when me and my ex split up. So that was right when I started my business. And that was, was that around 2014, 2013? It was about four years ago, yeah. 2014, okay. So one of the things I read about you you, in your bio, it mentioned that um, you said you struggled through those first 18 months Mm -hmm. of your business and how you felt your lack of confidence in other areas of your life affected your entrepreneurial life. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I brought in, you know, all of the BS stories and the blaming and the shaming and all of this, you know, kind of like I, I call it little girl stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, it's just, you know, I, I wasn't evolved. I felt like I wasn't a woman yet. You know, I really felt like this journey that I've been on for the last four years has really evolved me into like this amazing woman versus a little girl that I was um, before, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it did definitely affect me. Um, Um, You know, actually, it was 2013 when I decided I was going to start my own business. Mm -hmm. Um, But I didn't make any money until 2014, until mid 2014, because I I didn't put myself out there. You know, I was scared. I let my doubts, you know, take over. I, I had lots of fear. I acted like I didn't know what I was doing. I never made offers. I didn't, you know, let people know that that they could work with me. I was just kind of hiding and hanging out on the sidelines, pretending like I was doing stuff, (laughs) essentially, for the first year and a half. Right. Keeping busy with other things, but not really, really producing. 
Yeah. Right. Or producing things that would make you money, I should say. Exactly. Which is easy for sometimes for us to get caught up in. I've talked to people before and they talk about, you know, I was just doing things like the business cards and my logo Mm -hmm. and, you know, (laughs) things that are a part of the business technically. But it's sort of like it's a way sometimes for us to hide for way too long. Totally. 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 So when you um, changed your business, was it, excuse me, when you were doing the social media part of your business, was that within that 18 months or was it within that 18 months that things evolved? Yeah, I, I was a com- that's what that's where I started, you know, mm-hmm. so I, I was working with like local companies. So I was working with someone who, um, who did hair, um, I worked for a restaurant. And so I was doing more like it, it wasn't online stuff. It was more offline um, brick and mortar type mm-hmm. stores. So I was doing that, you know, basically freelance, I was freelancing while I was building my business. Now, since 2014, which you when you were going through that tough time, you've gone on to build your business from I read this in Forbes from zero to five hundred thousand in two years. Is that right? Yes. So, um, yeah. So 2013, like I said, I made zero (laughs) dollars. So I hesitate to even say I was in business that year because (laughs) technically I wasn't because a business actually makes money. Um, In 2014, I I, kind of started to get my act together. I really basically I came to a point where it was like, I either need to do this or I need to go get a job for 10 bucks an hour. And I decided that I was going to do it. And I really had to, you know, put all the the stories and everything behind me and and just really go for it. And I did that. I probably mid beginning to mid of 2014. And by the end of that year, I I had made $35,000 in my business, um, which is not too shabby for my first profitable year. You know, I I was doing okay. I was doing pretty good. Um, But I knew that I could do more. And I had surrounded myself with people who um, were doing more. And I I was seeing it, you know, instead of people making 35,000 in one year, they were making 35,000 in one month. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it really just opened my eyes to the possibility possibility and and I'm a very competitive person and you know I see if somebody can do something I know that I can do it as well so you know I kind of put myself in a position where um, I I wanted to be challenged and I also started working on my mindset Um, I started uncovering a lot of the money mindset stuff and stories that I had that I didn't even know I had and so like I mentioned before you know with my dad saying, you know, that he has to work really hard for his money. And, you know, there were so many stories that came from my parents and my father that I brought into my life and my business when it came to money. And I really had to uncover what those were and remove them and get rid of them. So that first year, that 2014 year, um, was a lot of discovery around that stuff. And I feel like once I was able to eliminate a lot of those stories and change my beliefs, um, that's when everything completely changed. Um, the game changed. I blew the roof off of the income ceiling that I had. Um, and the following year, I made $535,000. That is amazing, Jen. I love that. That's an amazing story and empowering story, too. Yeah, and it was just just crazy because I didn't even realize, you know, and if I look back, I, I, there was a pattern, you know, I feel like I had kept my own worth or I had kept what I believed that I could make because in my previous jobs, when I was getting paid at the casino, when I was getting paid, you know, to do marketing for all of these other companies, my um, salary was around 35 to Mm $40,000. So now looking back, I'm like, well, it's no surprise that, you know, when I start my own business, the first year I made 35, $40,000 because I thought that was normal. Like that was I your, thought, the mindset, that, that was yeah. your po- mindset possibility at that point. That was my cap. That's what I thought was possible. So yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me now that I look back, um, you know, that that's what I had capped myself at for that year. So how did you go about um, the, the turning things around with your mindset? And I ask, um, example, for example, did you seek out a coach? Did you go through some courses or what was it? Or was it something you did on your own? What was it for you that really shifted everything? Yeah, there was two major things. And, and I don't think I would have been able to do it on my own because I didn't even know that I had the story. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, you know, interesting. It was like, oh, wait, I do have a story. Oh, wait, I do have these beliefs that aren't even mine, um, but that I'm living by. And so the first thing that I, d- that I did was um, I read and then took um, the Lucky Bitch Money Boot Camp course with mm-hmm. Denise Duffield Thomas. Um, and that is the thing that really opened my eyes to all of these really horrible beliefs I had around 
around money. Like rich people are bad. Um, you have to save your money. You can't have everything you want. You have to work hard for your money. So um, that of course really helped me uncover a lot of the things that um, were holding me back subconsciously. I didn't even realize that they were. Um, so it was that. And then later on in that year, I hired my first like real coach, um, long-term coach. And it was funny because I, I thought that she was a business coach and um, she was in a sense, but uh, for the most part, everything that we did and everything that we worked together was all on mindset. It was on mindset, alignment, um, and really just belief in myself and worthiness. So, you know, I already had the background in marketing and social media. I didn't really need a coach to, to tell me how to do that stuff. I really needed to dig deeper. And that's what, what I did with my first coach. Excellent. Now, in your work today, you help women create successful, profitable businesses by developing mastery in two main areas, which we've talked about some or both actually mindset and marketing. Yep. So why are these two areas in particular important, especially uh, from the side of you being able to train other women how to make sure those areas are are she's mastered those areas? Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that, that that's it. Like if you have the right mindset, even the marketing can kind of go on the wayside a little bit. Um, I, I really feel like 90% of it is, is mindset um, and identity and the other 10% is marketing and strategy. And, you know, so when I started my business and just having the background of marketing, having the background of social media, that's, that's what I was teaching people. I'm really, really good at it. I'm really good at training. I'm really good at helping people um, take complex ideas and break them down and, and make it really easy for somebody to start their own business and so most of my early programs and most of the ways that I worked with people one-on-one -on -one in the beginning was straight marketing and social media um, and you know as I started to work with more people as I you know had my own journey and what I realized is that most of the work that I ended up doing with my clients was around the mindset and the identity and I realized you know not only for them but also for me how incredibly important um, that piece of it is and I feel like that's 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 missing in a lot of marketing strategies. That's missing in a lot of courses and things where people talk about starting your business. So I started to evolve my own business and start to incorporate more of the mindset stuff into my marketing. And I actually have... Um, developed what I call uh, mindset infused marketing, where it's like regular marketing, you know, techniques, but with um, identity infused and mindset infused actions. Mm. Do you think that we that most of us cannot be successful if we don't adopt the right mindset? Is it a barrier that you feel very strongly? Well, obviously you do, but do you feel yeah. very strongly that it could, <laughs> you feel very strongly that it's a good idea to get to master it? But do you feel very strongly that it is what holds most of us back? Yeah, I, I would say 99% of people. And I feel like even if, if even if somebody can experience a little bit of success, um, you know, maybe they launch a program or they launch a business and they have, you know, a little bit of success. Um, I think the longevity and sustainability of their success and, and what they're able to accomplish can only be really be achieved when they master their mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a six-figure success mindset mini course that I saw on your website. Yes. So if you had to choose the first step or the most important step that we should take to adjust our mindset, what would it be? It's definitely awareness. It, it, that mm. has to be the first step. A lot of people are either in denial um, or they were like me, where they were just completely clueless and naive that they even had an issue or that they have a problem or that something is holding them back. Um, so awareness for me is always the first step. Like you have to be aware of it and you have to know and understand like where it's even where the root of it is, like where is it even coming from in order to be able to to fix it or change it or shift it. And is the best way to do that, do you suggest of getting a coach or someone trusted mentor from the outside to sort of look in? I mean, I, I feel like if you're, you're strong enough and you know that, you know, there is something that you could do it on your own. Um, I think that, you know, there's different techniques and journaling strategies and things like that. But um, it really depends on where you're at. So if you're in a type of place where you're like, I don't have a money story or you're completely in denial, then yes, it, it probably would, you know, make more sense to have somebody from the outside look in and kind of ask you those tough questions and dig deep with you. Um, but if you already have an awareness of like mindset and you already have an awareness of like, okay, something's blocking me or I have some sabotages, you could, you know, pretty much like figure a lot of it out with 
journaling and other, you know, simple mindset techniques that I actually share in that, that mini course. I think one of the things I like that you, sh- you shared earlier was um, almost, you didn't use this language, but almost like some of us, most of us have blind spots. Mm-hmm. So that's why I asked about that of someone getting someone from the outside. Cause like you said, it, it takes awareness, but sometimes you have no clue that you have yeah. these things until, <laughs> and something a couple other women I've interviewed have said, they use the phrase, it's hard to read the label from inside the jar. Oh, and that's I a good always, one. Isn't that a good one, Jen? <laughs> yeah, I, like that. <laughs> that's a good one. So that always makes me like, okay. In fact, it's one of the things that I was already thinking about getting a coach some time ago. And it really made me say, okay, as much as I think I know, as evolved mm-hmm. as I think I am, I need somebody <laughs> to read my label. So I got a business coach. I love that. Yeah. I love that saying. Yeah. And, and it's absolutely true. I can't tell you how many people I get on the phone with and they're like, I can do this for my clients and I can help my clients with this, but I can't help myself. And right. it's just so true. It's so common. And it really, it's hard to see when you're in it. It's um, hard to see it really is. Especially when you're in the thick of it, yeah. like with building your business or just starting out or whatever new thing that you're embarking on. So do you mostly work with clients uh, one-on-one now, or or do you mostly do programs and courses and things that you have, or is it a combination in your business? Yeah, so actually um, this year I will be shifting out of the one-on-one model. I've done one-on-one a lot. (laughs) I've worked with a lot of one-on-one, and, you know, there was a point where I was working with, you know, 10 to 12 people at a time, and Mm -hmm. it it did just become very draining and and overwhelming um, because, you know, the, the type of work that I do. It's not just a marketing piece, but it really is diving deep in with somebody and and getting in the trenches with them and so I've shifted away from doing a lot of that one-on-one I still have a couple one-on-one clients very exclusive very um just people that I really really love (laughs) so you know it allows me to be a little bit more picky about who I work with so that I know that I'm working with the right people and I can really stand behind them but most of my um income comes from workshops so um like online workshops, um, more like masterminds and group cor- group courses. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Now with marketing, you have, um, I believe it's a course, 30 ways or maybe a, a, a download, 30 ways to increase visibility and stand out in the crowded online industry. Yes. Is that a, is it a course or? No, it's a free resource that I created. Yeah. Okay. You had so many resources on your side. <laughs> That's why like, I don't know what this one was, but they were all fantastic. So what would you say then are, three to five, we'll say, um, steps that we can take to increase our visibility, say, over the next 30 to 60 days? Awesome question. Yeah. And and there's so many ways, obviously. I I listed 30 in the resource, but there's also other different ways. But I would say the top, um, number one is get interviewed. So just like you're doing with me right now, Mm -hmm. um, you know, get on a podcast, get on a telesummit, get on an interview, like have somebody, you know, talk to you about your business and then present you to their audience. I am all about leveraging other people's audiences because I don't feel like you need to um, build your own audience from scratch all the time. That's a great tip. And of course, I, you know, I might be biased because I love podcasts. So I always tell, try to tell people to get on podcasts. It's such a great way to spread your message from the comfort of wherever you are. So I'm all Absolutely. about that. Excellent. Cool. Yes. Um, and so my next one um, really kind of is very similar to that, but it's really a contribute. So whatever content you have, whatever your expertise is, contribute to um, online sites, um, online magazines, guest posting, guest blogging, same concept, like use someone else's audience, right? Because especially if you're just starting from scratch or you're not really sure, you're not going to dump a bunch of money into Facebook ads to try to build an audience. Um, it's, you know, getting noisier and noisier online to try to, you know, stand out in like a Facebook group or something. Um, share your expertise with someone who has an audience of thousands or tens of thousands or even possibly hundreds of thousands like the Huffington Post or Mind Body Green or you know some of these other really amazing um, places that want contributions they want people to share you know their expertise with their audience so instead of publishing on your own site or writing a blog for your own site where maybe only a hundred or a couple hundred might see it, um, get it in front of a site where they have thousands of viewers, thousands of readers. And a lot of these places also will share your articles with either their social media or their newsletter, uh, which is really amazing. I used to write for some really awesome places. And I remember one time they had sent out their daily newsletter that they send. Mm -hmm. And one of my articles made the newsletter. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. There's like, they probably have like 300,000 people on their newsletter. Now, 300,000 people have seen me versus 100. Right. 200. 
Do you suggest also, and I don't want to skip ahead if this is in your, your steps, <laughs> but, um, but just to piggyback on, I call it OPP, other people's platforms, um, <laughs> is um, do you think LinkedIn also, even though that's not necessarily someone else's platform, but I hear a lot of people talk more about the importance of also posting articles on LinkedIn? Yeah, LinkedIn is doing, I love that they added that feature. I think it's really awesome. So yeah, I will republish my blogs on LinkedIn. Medium also is getting like a lot of play. Um, you know, lots of people that I've talked to that have published on Medium are getting, you know, thousands of views um, on their articles and comments and things like that. So the only thing with it, you just really have to know how to leverage it, right? So you can write an article, you can post it on LinkedIn, you can post it on a different site. Um, but if you're not actually leveraging that, and getting people to get back to your site, then, you know, really, you're doing it for no reason. So make sure that you have a strategy in place to actually leverage when your article goes live. And by leveraging it, you mean links back and that those kinds of yeah. things? Those kinds like of getting strategy. people, yeah, getting people to, to sign up for your list and get to your site and download your stuff. Excellent. Step three. All right. So step three is, um, this is an interesting one. Um, but again, we're going on this theme of like, your OPP. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Which is um, write a testimonial or a review for your coach or your mentor. Um, and, you know, in, in, in other words, um, what I call it is become the star student. So, you know, we all buy a lot of courses or books or webinars. And, you know, most people don't actually go through the stuff, which is, like boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but most people don't actually go through the stuff or they don't take it seriously. And, and I found that the, the biggest ways that I have gotten visibility is my coaches and my mentors talking about me, my coaches and my mentors sharing, um, you know, my business and sharing my success stories with their audience. Again, I'm getting exposure to somebody who already has an audience that trusts them. Um, so whenever you sign up for a course, whenever you sign up to work with a coach, like I always, you know, have you know, an aim to be their star student, to be the person that is like, you know, top, 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 so that number one, they recognize me, um, they like me, right? And they want to share my success story with their audience. So this is another great way. I mean, you can just look on people's sites and you see testimonials that are written. I know I have testimonials from some of my amazing clients and I have link links back to their website. So that's free visibility and free exposure for them. You could even do this for books. Um, you can do this for maybe free trainings that you download from someone, giving them a testimonial on it. We love to hear that we're making an impact. We love to hear that people are getting results from our, our content. So just a quick, easy way to utilize something you already have and write a review and get it put up on their site. That's good, Jen. I hadn't thought of that. And I take tons of <laughs> courses and things. And sometimes I will email a note to someone, but I've never thought of it as a strategy, which is super yeah. smart because you're still giving and offering something. Yes. And then you're, yes, very good. They, and, and most people will do a link back, you right, know, so right. they'll have your name and then they'll have a link right to your, to your, you know, website. So free exposure. Free exposure. All right, I think you got to <laughs> give us five. I said three to five, but they're um, so good now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my next one is, is a little bit more general, um, but it's really just to create kick ass content. Like if you can, you know, get really great, great content and put it out into the world, it's number one going to position you as the expert in whatever your field is. And it's going to give you credibility. It's going to it's going to have people look at you and be like, wow, this person really knows their stuff. I want to hire them. I want more of what they have. But, you know, I think sometimes people get a little caught up in you know, what should I give away for free versus what should I, what should I charge for? And um, I say like, give it all away for free, give your best stuff away for free. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, if you're just giving away the bare minimum, or you're giving away like just, you know, not enough, but like, people aren't going to trust you. Right. They're going to think that your content is crap. They're going to feel like, oh, well, their free stuff is crap. Well, their paid stuff must be crap, too. Um, so you definitely want them thinking the opposite. You want them thinking like, holy moly, like I just got all of this stuff from this person for free. I can imagine what I would get if I paid this person. I can't imagine what I would get if I signed up for their course or I started working with them one on one. So you really I mean, you have just one time to make a good first impression and your free content that you create, that is your first impression. That's the first thing. That's the first, you know, introduction that somebody has to your, your brand and your business. You have to make it amazing. You have to make it great. 
That's so good. And I think, um, do you think mindset kind of plays a role in that too? And I ask because I know sometimes I've even spoken to people about things that I've created. The first thing I thought of when you were talking is this free course I have on how to create your brand story because it's something people started asking me about a lot. So I created a video course around your brand story. But that's something I also offer to people. And some folks gave me feedback like, I can't believe you're giving all this yeah. away. I can't. The thing is, though, I said most people still won't do it themselves. A lot of times, even if I watch something, it's great. Just what you said. It's great content. It's amazing. And I think I need this person to do this, whatever I'm watching for me, you know, but also I think part of that, let me know what you think is a mindset thing too. this sort of fear or scarcity of if I give it away, you know, no one's going to pay me for my expertise. What exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head. Scarcity mindset. Absolutely. And and I feel the same way you do. I feel like I can give someone the content, but if, if they don't have the means or if they don't have the, the sources to like do it themselves, they're going to want to hire me. They're going to want to take my course or mm-hmm. take that next step because you're giving them great stuff, but it's still, it's not enough. And there's, there's always also going to be, you know, the majority of people in your audience aren't going to buy from you. I mean, look at the statistics, look at, you know, the numbers, you know, but you're able to impact people and really even change lives without somebody even buying something from you. And, you know, the people that will buy from you will buy from you, you know, so that's what we have to kind of keep in mind. It's like, yeah, maybe only 3% of people will ever buy from us, but that's going to be enough, you know, and so get rid of that scarcity mindset. Yeah, the more you give, um, the more you'll get. Excellent. And number five, Number five is is probably going to seem like, uh, Jen, that's it. Um, but it's get, get on live video. Um, it's huge right now. Um, whatever fears you may have around being on video, um, around just like, you know, and I have people that are um, – like don't mind doing regular video, but they're scared to death of doing live video. <laughs> now live, like Facebook um, live, you mean? Yeah, like a Facebook or live. Instagram or Instagram. Or... Yeah, even like YouTube is doing live now. Instagram. Oh. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, every, everyone's doing it. Um, <laughs> and it really is just like the new wave. You know, people want to see the real you. And that's what I like about live video because you can watch these heavily produced, you know, videos and they're great and they're awesome and you get your your thing, but you really get to know somebody when you're watching them live, when you're, they, they have no safety net, <laughs> you know, there's no do-overs, um, you're raw, you're real, you're on there, you're communicating with people, you're in the flesh, like it's just a, such a great way to connect with people and build trust faster with people. Now, I'm an introvert, um, me being on live video every single day is not feasible for me, you know, so w- whatever your bandwidth is know what your bandwidth is and do that if it's just once a week um do it once a week that'll be enough for people to see you and then you can use other methods like writing or podcasting or something else to continue to communicate with those people but i would say at least once a week get on live if you're just going to do it once a week i always recommend my clients to like make a show out of it so kind of like your podcast like give it a name say you know it's going to be the Mm. Jen show it's going to be on Wednesdays at 12 p.m Mm. so kind of like you know you're 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 challenging yourself and you're also letting your audience know like hey I'm going to show up you know I'm going to show up once a week right and so you don't have to feel this pressure of okay I got to be on live stream 10 times a day every single day I know people that do that I don't know how they do that um but you know if you really love it and you want to be on every day be on every day right but um really just understand like your bandwidth and what you can do but it's definitely something not to be ignored it's definitely something that is the new wave facebook has even given more play to people who are doing their live videos so it's a bandwagon you're gonna have to jump on you have to it's so funny this is why you're great at what you do because i was as you were talking certainly was listening but i was thinking i'm going to have to ask her though what if you feel like you don't have anything to talk about or how do you be consistent and that kind of thing and you totally address that when you said think of it as a show yeah. Make it as a show because yeah. that's with me with the podcast. I always talk about the importance of being consistent because people say, how do you do a show five days a week? Got to be consistent. This is what I said. <laughs> this is what but I think of it. It's a show. Yeah. So that is really good advice. And then it sort of gives you I'll speak for myself. This is what I was thinking. It gives me some structure <laughs> to think about what it could sort of be about because I think live video. What am I going to show people of me, you know, working on my business and that kind of thing? But if you think of it as a show, it gives you some other ideas. Yeah, behind the scenes stuff. I mean, you could even be 
doing a live stream right now while you're interviewing me, you know? Mm. Um, and anyway, you're so it's good. Very simple, right? <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I mean, and I was very resistant to it. I was resistant to doing video at all in the beginning. And I actually used to have a podcast called 15 Minutes of Flame. Um, and, you know, it, that helped me. My, my podcast helped me get out of my shell. And mm. then once I was really confident in just like who I was and, and what I was doing, then I was able to like be more confident on, um, video. So if you're scared to death of doing video, you don't like it, or you don't like live video, baby steps. Um, and I also tell people start with Instagram, because Instagram video is one minute, right? So you can do a one minute video. Right. Um, and then just practice and do it daily or do it as much as you can. And you will get more confident. I know people who hated like refused to be on video refused to be on live refused to even be like face to face on Skype that are like obsessed with doing Facebook live stream now. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You know, so yeah, it just takes, you know, and you got to know the difference too between like not liking something and just resistance. Right. You know? And for anyone who is still resistant to it, I know with Facebook live, as you mentioned, they're giving Facebook is sort of giving more priority to those mm -hmm. live videos. And I think now it may have been for a while, but I think now you can also have replays. So it's not like the video disappears. So it is creating content. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, even if you look at the Facebook app, there's a, a tab there now that is for video, just for video. So they have mm -hmm. a lot of stuff up their sleeves. So mm -hmm. jump on board now. <laughs> That's right. Excellent. Those are great tips. I love it. Thank you for having five. Five You're good welcome. ones. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, in one of your blog posts, I saw that you mentioned uh, when we encounter failure with something we've created, whether it's a program or something for our audience, a lot of us think that we should scrap the whole thing when we really may just need to make a change to one or two things. So I wanted to make sure to ask you, what are, the, what are some of the things that we should look to first before we scrap something? Because sometimes yeah. we think it didn't work. That's it. I'm <laughs> never doing it again. Yeah, definitely. I always like everyone to, you know, kind of do do an evaluation. So if you launch a product and maybe you wanted 100 people in there and you got 10 or, you know, you wanted 10 and you got one, like you, you definitely want to evaluate like what what did I do? What went right? What worked? What got people engaged and involved? And what didn't work so well? So I always want people to do an evaluation. But, you know, some of the things I would look at is, and this is something that I feel like is, is probably the number one thing of why things don't work out. And it's just exposure. There's just more times than not, it's a problem of numbers and they just didn't get exposure to enough people. Um, so I think there's a, the misconception of like, oh, I have an audience of 100 people, you know, 50 people are going to buy. Um, and, and that's just not the case, you know, so you really have to know your numbers and just make sure that, hey, if my goal was 100 people, did I get in front of 10,000 people? Um, you know, because that's the amount of people that need to see your offer if you want 100 people in it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that's definitely like the top thing is just, just make sure that you had enough exposure for your offer to reach those goals. Um, other things could just be um, like your delivery. So it could have been, you know, maybe you did a webinar and your people really don't respond to webinars. Maybe they would have responded better to um, a live video or a challenge or something like that. So, you know, most times it's not necessarily about the offer itself. It really is just in the presentation and the delivery of how they launch it. I also just did a podcast episode about not being afraid to experiment. And do you think that's something that we should adopt as well? Sort of what you mentioned of, you know, maybe it wasn't they don't res your audience doesn't respond to webinars as well as they would to something else. But I think you have to be willing to experiment to find those things out. Some people think webinars are working for everyone. So, <laughs> you know, fill in the blank. What do you think? Yeah, no, no, I don't I don't have that philosophy. I have this um, what I call the feel good philosophy in my business. And I encourage my clients to do the same. And essentially what it is, is you do what feels good and you don't do anything that doesn't feel good, period, end. Mm -hmm. So if you hate webinars, you don't do webinars. You find a different method and a different strategy that's going to get you similar results. Um, if you, you know, we just talked about like live video. If you don't like live video, maybe you do recorded video, but you have to do something, you know, you have to figure out a way to make yourself feel good about it. Um, but if it's something that just doesn't feel good, I say don't do it. Just because the gurus say you have to do this, you have to run, run a web. I never run webinars, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I run webinars like every once in a while and to be honest I really don't like them that much um which is why I don't run them that much I know people that have you know will never get on the live stream but they're like doing a million dollars a year so you really just have to find what your strength is and and play to that strength 
and find the method that works for you find the thing that feels good and go full force with that method you know so I'm all about experimenting and trying different things but I'm also about not trying everything like you don't have to do everything you have to find the one thing that works and then keep doing it keep doing it double down on the thing that works (laughs) now I noticed you had a quote on Instagram that I really loved it said you cannot be committed to your bullshit and to your growth it's one or the other speaking about the one thing so what are the ways that you have had to get over your own bullshit and recommit to your growth Yeah, so uh, we talked about it a little bit in the beginning with just, you know, really having like coming to a point where it was like, okay, Jen, um, are you going to play into like the person that you've always been, you know, someone who's, you know, just always blaming people, never accepting responsibility, never really, you know, going for it? Or are you going to do something different? You know, are you going to do something different? Are you going to change your life? Are you going to do, you know, be the role model for your son that you want to be? So it really does have to do with a decision, right? keep doing what you're doing, right? If it's not working and you keep doing it, I mean, it just doesn't even make any sense, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Or, you know, if you want something different, you have to do something different, you know? And and I feel a lot of people just maybe feel like I can just think that I want to do something different or say it out loud or make a New Year's resolution, right? But (laughs) um, the reality is no. Like, you actually have to take that inspired action to make that thing happen and consciously make a decision to do things differently. I think, too, the wording of your quote is so good where it says you being uh, you cannot be committed to your bullshit because sometimes people say I'm committed to this. I'm committed to that or, or just I'm committed and they don't say to <laughs> what. you can be committed to the wrong thing right? to the thing that's actually hurting you. So be aware Absolutely. of your commitment. <laughs> what would you say, Jen, entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? Oh, just oh, so much. <laughs> it has been such an incredible, amazing journey. Um really just just learned uh, exactly what I just said too. like um, really has to do with like taking responsibility taking responsibility for my life and knowing that like anything that happens whether it's a success or a failure or win or a loss it's all me (laughs) and I think that's something that that is hard for a lot of people to deal with Um, and I think that's why a lot of people don't become entrepreneurs as well or have no desire to become entrepreneurs because it's all you It's all you, whether you succeed or fail, even if you have a coach, even if you've taken courses, it's not your coach's, um, you know, job to make you successful or to make you fail. Um, It's absolutely 1000% your job to create what you want. And that's one thing that I learned, you know, because in the past, I was always blaming other people. I was always like, oh, it's not my fault, or I didn't do that. Or, you know, I mean, just kind of like, um, you know, never taking that full responsibility for what I had created in my life, you know, and it was always like, oh, woe is me, you know, I have to deal with this, and this happened to me, and, you know, and just not taking full responsibility. So that's one thing I think that that has been a consistent lesson for me um, in entrepreneurship. And even when I hire my own coaches, I always talk about what I call, I call it PR, um, personal responsibility. Mm. When I hire my coaches and, and, you know, I, or I decide to invest in a coach or a course, I make it my personal responsibility to get a 10 X return on that. So that means me stepping up, you know, that doesn't mean, Oh, this coach has to do it for me, but it's like, I'm taking personal responsibility. I'm investing, I'm stepping up. I'm, I'm going to make sure that I receive this 10x return on my investment. Um, But I know that it's all me. Do you feel like learning how to take personal responsibility also helped you with you mentioned to us earlier that you were were or are an introvert? I'm an introvert, too. (laughs) But do you feel like that helped you, though, say, okay, even though I'm an introvert or I'm an introvert and I still have to step up and step out? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I used being an introvert in the beginning as like a crutch Mm. or I used it as an excuse like, oh, I can't do that. I'm an introvert. Well, that's not really what an introvert means. You know, I mean, there's lots of people that are introverted and they still um, are able to do really amazing things. And, you know, for me, um, you know, that what I relate to most with being an introvert is that I, you know, I'm an empath as well. So I take on other people's energy. So if I'm like coaching a lot of people, like when I was coaching 10 to 12 people at a time, I couldn't handle that. It was just way too much on my shoulders. You know, if I go to an event that has a couple hundred people, 300 people, I can't be at that event the whole day. You know, I can't, I need to recharge and re-energize. So for me, yeah, that's what I've learned is that really the, the introvert in me really has to do with my energy and my bandwidth. And 
I just had to learn, you know, what that energy and what that bandwidth allowed me to do. And I had to learn how to balance that and make sure that I always keep that in check. Um, it didn't mean that I was shy. It didn't mean that I couldn't go out and be seen. It just meant that I needed to learn how to manage my, my energy. Mm-hmm. So in closing, Jen, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Oh, this is such a hard question because there's so many people. Mm-hmm. Um, man, I would, I, would, I would have to say it, it was my coach, Jesse Elder. Um, he was a coach that I hired last year and a total game changer. I, I really hired him because I wanted him to help me with like my membership site or something. <laughs> I think it was or like make sales. And it, what he turned out to be for me was just it was completely life changing. He ended up being like my spiritual coach, my spiritual guru, my relationship coach, my life coach, my sales coach, like he was literally everything for me. And he just held this beautiful, amazing space for me. And, and the other part of that, I was actually just telling the story earlier was that the investment that I had to make to work with him was n- not even close to anything I ever spent in my life. I, I went to a conference, I saw him speak, I was like, man, I, I would pay that guy a lot of money to work with him. And it was just, I guess, a premonition on my part. And we ended up connecting. And we got on the phone. And, you know, I basically I knew that I wanted to work with him. I, I had a gut feeling. And I just, you know, felt the connection that, that I was definitely going to work with this person. And so he did the whole, you know, sales call spiel. And I kind of just let him do it, even though I already knew I was going to hire him. I had no idea what the investment was. Um, I was like, yes, I'm in I'm doing this. This is right for me. And he told me what the investment was $30,000 for three months. Mm. And I was like, Wow. <laughs> was this early this is, on in your business? This was after the 18 about months. Halfway. Right. Yeah, no, this was last year. Okay. Um, this was like the beginning of last year. So it was about midway through. Um, so I hadn't I had invested a lot, you know, and but I had not invested that much um in one person. Um and you know, I also feel like the other part of the life changing experience was not just working with him, but making that investment and saying yes to myself and knowing that I was worthy and also taking that personal responsibility that like I'm gonna invest this money because I want to make a million dollars, you know? And within the three months that I worked with him, or actually it was even it wasn't even three months, it was six six weeks that we had worked together and I had made three hundred thousand dollars in that six weeks. So So you had ten X your investment. Yes. It was just such a powerful experience for me, like saying yes at that level. So it really just transformed me as a whole and you know, just the support that I got from him in all areas of my life was just amazing and incredible. So um, he knows this. I've already told him he's an amazing person. I tell everyone about him. But yeah, I really feel like he was a paradigm shift for me in my business. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. And thank you for sharing too, just the part about making an investment. And, and that's a, you're an, a, another example from you about um either moving beyond that fear having or not having the fear and just the mindset of I'm going to invest and I know that I'm going to get a return on this. I'm not going to be limited by my own fear of thinking I can't do this right now. This isn't going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Say yes. I love it. That's (laughs) great. Jesse Elder, E-L-D-E-R. Yep. Okay. I'm going to see if I can find his website. We'll make sure we link to it. Excellent. Jen, thank you so much. This was fantastic. I appreciate all of your tips and advice. It just, I can go on forever and ever asking (laughs) questions. This was fantastic. Awesome, Elaine. Thank you so much for having me. This is incredible. Oh, good. Now tell us before you go how we can support you. Tell everyone your website, any social media or anything else you want us to know about. Yeah, so I'm Jen Scalia everywhere. I guess there's no other Jen Scalia's. Mm-hmm. Um, so whatever platform you're on, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'm just Jen Scalia. Um, and you can actually go um, join my group. I have a group of 13,000 people um, where I share like my live streams and, and tips like these. Um, and that's just jenscalia.com forward slash tribe, T-R-I-B-E. Mm-hmm. And my website is Jen Scalia. Um, and like Elaine said, I have lots and lots of free goodies on there. I have that free um six figure success mindset mini course on there. I have the free resource with the 30 ways for you to get visible online. Um, So tons of goodies in there. Um, Go check it out. Excellent. I'll make sure I link to the mini course and the the other things we talked about the 30 ways with marketing and all that great stuff. Jen, thank you so much. This was fantastic. And happy holiday season to you. Thank you, you, Elaine. Now before you go, what's your last parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? 
Oh, this is going to sound a little cliche, but <laughs> it's something that I had to learn um, in business. And, and I feel like I would have just, I wish I would have known it as soon as I started. And it really is to just be yourself and listen to yourself and trust yourself. Um, you know, I think like just being in the online space and, and starting a business and being surrounded by other people who are doing other things, we, we it's so easy to get distracted. Um, it's so easy to think that we have to perform. It's so easy to think that we have to be somebody else in order to be successful or for other people to like us. And, you know, just listen to yourself, listen to your intuition, um, know that you know what's right for you. And, you know, be yourself because people are going to fall in love with the real you. Um, they're going to fall in love with your stories. They're going to connect with your stories. So share that. Don't look at your stories in your past as like a bad thing or something that you want to hide. Like share it because that's really going to be the connection point between you and the people that whose lives that you're going to change. Jen Scalia, thank you so much. Hold on just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jen Scalia. Make sure you do a little check in with yourself. What are you telling yourself? What is your story? What is your mindset? Is any of that holding you back? Now, to find out more about Jen, to get in touch with her, to find out and get links to those great resources she mentioned in this episode, I want you to go to supportissexypodcast.com. Go to the search icon at the top and just type in Jen. J-E-N-N. Her show notes page will pop up with those links and those resources. It'll all be there for you. Support is sexy podcast.com and just type in Jen. All right. So thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate you. If you love what you've been hearing, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. I'm going to get back in my habit of reading the reviews on the podcast. I have to do that. We'll start that next week. But I love hearing from you. I do read all of the reviews. I love getting emails from you. So many of you email me, which is wonderful. Elaine at Elaine Love hearing from you on social media. In other words, I appreciate you. So thank you for being here. All right. So now until we talk again, you know, you got to remember you deserve support and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.